My previous video in which I objectively demonstrate that there's no particular sound quality to vinyl apart from surface noise triggered an avalanche of butthurt evangelical vinyl fanatics to attack me in the comments. Fortunately, I'm impervious to low-tier name-calling from analog purist audiophiles who claim that vinyl sounds better than digital. Anyone who makes the claim that vinyl sounds better than digital is either ignorant, delusional, or both. There's many reasons why this common audiophile claim is completely wrong, but I'm just going to focus on the top three reasons. High-end digital equipment, whether it's old or new, but the focus here is on high-quality, high-end digital equipment, it doesn't have a sound. You can't hear it. It's transparent. That's the point of it, and that's why it became popular originally back in the late 70s, because of its more transparent nature than the traditional analog methods at the time. Anyone who's engineered at a high-quality recording studio will tell you you can't really hear the difference between the monitor pass. So when people are playing out in the live room and you listen directly back from the microphones over the console and then you flick to the tape returns if it's 2496 and you've got a low buffer size so there's not really much delay or if you do like uh, ABX test where you mute it in between it's really really basically impossible to tell the difference the only way that you can tell the difference if there's like a noisy tape return or something broken and giving it away or if you can really hear the difference you're not sitting in a high quality studio if you're sitting in a high quality studio it's you can do ABX tests all day long and you'll find it almost impossible to tell the difference between what's coming into the desk from the mics directly live as the musicians play it and listening um, back to the tape returns. It's almost indistinguishable, if not indistinguishable to almost all people who are going to hear that. So I know the truth is highly triggering to analog purist hi-fi enthusiasts and I'm going to get loads more hate comments in the comment section down below. But sorry, I'm not part of your delusional little club. I'm supposed to be a professional audio engineering channel. I'm not part of the consumer hi-fi scene. And just because YouTube pumped my last video out to the hi-fi crowd, it doesn't mean that I have to start believing in Flat Earth or the Tooth Fairy. I always found it a bit odd that these hi-fi audio file types will spend thousands of euros on cables and stuff that doesn't really matter in their pursuit to get the closest to the original sound of the recording possible like it sounded in the control room as it was recorded but they've never set foot in a recording studio and listened to how it sounds in the recording studio and the fact that the studios where their favorite records were recorded use long lines of bog standard copper wire over a rusty old patch bay that was pulled out of a telephone exchange you know they're called post office jacks for a reason you know as well as the fact that our higher fires are set up in their living room with zero acoustic treatment but anyway the second reason why it may be very silly to claim that vinyl sounds better than digital, especially for records the late 70s and onwards, is because many records had an overt digital production stage, like this one for example, Donald Fagan's most highly acclaimed record. This got nominated for seven Grammy Awards, and many people use this as a reference, a benchmark album. Many audiophiles absolutely love listening to this record on vinyl, and there's a big vinyl player on the cover just saying how vinyl or analog is so superior, the best format to listen on, but it was recorded completely digitally. So if you say that vinyl sounds better than digital and Donald Fagan is in there somewhere, well, that's completely stupid because he recorded this album digitally. A lot of Stevie Wonder's records were recorded completely digitally. And if it wasn't recorded digitally, many records were edited with digital tools. Even from the late 70s, a lot of classical recordings, most classical recordings throughout the 80s, in fact, were recorded completely digitally because the dynamic range is the superior. And if you've got an orchestral recording, you need a big dynamic range. And the most suitable format for a large dynamic range is digital. But perhaps most importantly, from the late 70s onwards, mastering studios started to adopt digital delay lines in their cutting racks. Ampex released the ADD-1 in 1979 and it was marketed for that exact purpose and pretty much after that everyone just started adopting digital delays in their cutting racks. So why is that? Why do you need delay to cut records anyway? This is going to require a bit of explanation so I'll draw it out here. So normally you cut the grooves and if they run into each other obviously that is bad, you don't want that because the record's going to skip, it's not going to work. Instead you can come along and just say okay well I'm just going to define the maximum groove width that is possible. It's X groove width and you can't exceed that and everything's just going to fit inside these predefined zones. 
So everything's safe, the grooves aren't gonna run into each other because they can't. This is called fixed pitch. And this is how the original lathes work. But notice if we cut silence, it's just wasting space. We've got a whole bunch of space, but we're just not using it. And so we can improve upon that using a variable pitch method. So we've got a loud sound, a quiet sound, a loud sound, and then the next groove could be silent or very quiet. And it doesn't take up a lot of space because it can be just sat right next to the previous groove. And if something goes loud, look, we can just move it out of the way and make it really loud and then go back. This is far superior because we can cut quiet and loud grooves and utilize the maximum possible space on the record. We have a really massively loud sound and we have really quiet sounds and we're utilizing the maximum possible space. With variable pitch cutting, you can cut way louder, fit way more on the record. Obviously, everyone wants variable pitch and no one wants fixed pitch. But the way it works is, let's say that you've got a sound normally. People normally think of a sound, a transient sound like that. That's not how it works on the vinyl. Because just imagine the previous groove, you're just going to completely collide with it. You can't do that. So what you have to do is go along and then move out of the way for the loud sound to anticipate the loud sound and then play the loud sound after you've moved out the way. So there's a moment that needs to be anticipated there and that can be anticipated incredibly quickly but if it's done too quickly you cause distortion and if it's done too slowly then you're just going to waste space on the record. So the vinyl lathe needs to peek into the future to know when the loud sound is coming. And although the average audio file might be gullible enough to believe in time travel, unfortunately lathes can't do that. We need a way to say, hey look lathe, there's a loud sound coming up, move out the way, ready for this sound, in anticipation. How do we do that? Well, we send the direct signal to the preview of the lathe so it knows what's coming up, and then we delay the signal which is going to be cut through the cutting head. And what kind of processing is used to delay the signal? Well, I'm very sorry, my analog purist audiophile friends, but unfortunately for you, it's a digital delay. Since the introduction of the Ampex ADD-1 in 1979, basically everyone switched. Mastering studios were one of the first places for widespread adoption of digital technology, especially in that part of the chain, and why is that? Well, if we read the advertising, Ampex's system with the digital delay allows for a superior signal to noise ratio. It saves time and money when compared to the traditional methods, and it has a greater performance value per dollar than any mastering system currently available. So pretty much most records since the 80s have had at least a digital process, even if they were recorded on analog tape, mastered to analog tape, and then cut to vinyl. Well, there's that cheeky delay there hidden in the vinyl cutting process. Now that's not to say it's not possible to do it all analog. Of course you can. You can do it with the tape machine. You just need the preview deck modification. Then you've got multiple playback heads and the time that it takes for the tape to physically travel from one of the playback heads to the next playback head is your delay. However, there's very few people actually preserving this all analog way of doing it. They're normally very specialist, small studios, like for example, salt mastering, where Paul Gold spent 15 years building his own custom vinyl mastering console. So yes, I built, um, this took me approximately 15 years to build. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of the AB Path console is for mastering directly from open reel tape to the lacquer master record without um, going into the computer. This is from the early 70s. It's an extremely rare deck. It's the only one I've ever seen. You, you load the tape here, and that's the preview head. Oh. That's the playback head. So you load, you load the tape there, and then you pull the tape, and you can see that that's for 7.5 IPS 33, 7.5 IPS 45, 15 IPS 45, and 15 I've been in a lot of mastering places. I've never seen that ever. But this is the only one inch preview deck ever made. So it's not like it doesn't exist, but this the vast majority of all records from the 80s onwards have been cut with the digital process. And that obviously includes all of the re-releases that were re-cut of the older stuff before that. 
So you could record an album through a vintage Neve console, go into two inch analog tape and use all of the analog outboard and bounce that down to a half inch analog master tape and give that to a mastering studio and they can use all of their analog EQ and compression and then send it straight to the Neumann VMS 70 or Neumann VMS 80 lathe that they have there and it's all analog up until it hits the digital delay in the cutting rack and now it's been digitized and transformed from analog to digital and then back to analog uh, and it's been cut. So now your analog chain has been polluted by that very last step in the cutting rack, the delay, which is necessary for getting a better cut. In my opinion, that's completely fine because the digital process is transparent. You can't really hear it, it doesn't matter. It sounds great and you can get the best quality cut when you're using a delay. So for me, I don't really care about that. But the analog purists, now their process, their analog chain has been polluted at the very last step. And I just find that quite ironic and funny that the analog purists are listening to all of these analog records, but most of those records probably had a digital delay. So it probably went through at least one stage of analog to digital and digital to analog in that chain because of the preview of the lathe. Some people commented on the previous video, yeah, sure, maybe the format itself isn't magical, but I generally buy vinyl because it's got more dynamic range. And that's what I'm interested in, hearing more dynamic range, it's less fatiguing, it sounds better, it's more exciting to listen to records with dynamic range. Yeah, sure, I agree, but you have to understand the way that this comes about. So as a mastering engineer, I do a lot of this. So I'll do the digital master first, and I will only issue someone the vinyl files for cutting after the digital master has been approved. We first get the digital master and then we get the vinyl master after because I don't want to issue the vinyl master and then there's revisions and then I have to like issue another set of vinyl masters and you've got all sorts of revisions on vinyl masters and then it's confusing what goes to vinyl. That's the complete mess. So I, I personally don't do that. My policy is I will first say no, we're going to get the digital masters until we're happy with those first and then we issue the vinyl masters. That's the way that I personally work. But the digital masters are normally going to be for general consumption. They don't want to have those super quiet because if you play it against something else, they're just going to be like, yeah, it sounds weak. And that's the general thing that people say. It sounds feeble or weak in comparison to other things that they've listened to. So you have to get the digital masters to a reasonable level so that people, the customers, the clients don't complain about it sounding weak and feeble. But then when it goes to vinyl, obviously you take all of that limiting and stuff off because it doesn't matter. It doesn't, the limiting doesn't affect the vinyl. It's not like you're going to have a louder cut because you've limited it more. That's not how it works on vinyl because uh, e even just the RIAA equalization throws a massive spanner in the works like all of these advocates of clipping for example if you clip you're not going to make it louder going to vinyl you're just going to make it sound worse so the way that you have a louder cut on vinyl is just taking more space up you need more space on the grooves so that's why people have double vinyl or even triple vinyl so that they can have a louder uh, cut with better signal to noise ratio less surface noise relative to the signal because if you try and stuff less music on each side you can make it louder because the grooves can be wider so that's how you make a louder cut on vinyl by making it physically louder just limiting it on vinyl doesn't actually do anything so it's completely stupid limiting to try and make it louder to go to vinyl so that's why you just take the limiters off to go to vinyl because it's stupid so that results in a state of affairs where the digital masters are always slammed and the vinyl is always way more dynamic it's just the way that it works in the industry now my personal suggestion of a way out of this predicament is not just to buy the vinyl because it sounds more dynamic it doesn't sound more dynamic it sounds identical in its dynamics to the vinyl files that were supplied for the cut the thing is you want to get the non-slammed high resolution wave files that's what you want so my personal suggestion is okay you can just release the slammed version to Spotify so people can put the music on in the background whilst they're doing the hoovering. That's fine for the general consumption. But then on Bandcamp, release higher quality non-slammed masters without limiters at all or the limiting like turned out like 6 dB or something. You can definitely do that and you can just say on Bandcamp, yeah, these are our high res non-limb versions 
of the of the album and people would massively appreciate that thing i think i'm gonna do that myself i haven't done that i don't know why i've actually talked about that to people i've made music with in the past and said let's issue high resolution no limb versions on bandcamp and it's just like yeah it's confusing because people don't know what one to get and they will listen to it and think it sounds too quiet and broken but no i think people nowadays get it they get that they want the dynamic one people who know what they're talking about want the dynamic one and people who know what they're talking about are probably gonna go to Bandcamp rather than just listening on on Spotify now one last thing before I wrap this video up on my previous video a lot of people said in the comments that I was hating on vinyl and I didn't understand the reasons why people listen to vinyl as an experience and they obviously didn't read the description of that video because I actually say in the description that vinyl is my favorite format and I love vinyl for these certain reasons and I always write description under my video to give more context additional information and I think it's valuable to read those descriptions because it's what I'm thinking as I'm uploading the video some maybe things I left out of the video or other things I want to mention and so if you are interested in my thoughts there maybe you can read the description I know not everyone's got time to read that but anyone who's interested in my videos you, uh, there's more information in the descriptions that I write on every single video under the links that I leave and so yeah I actually said very positive things about vinyl I can't hold a wave file in my hands like I can hold this vinyl in my hands and I can look at the artwork of this vinyl and then I can look at the lyrics which are on the sleeve or I can look at any additional inserts that the artist wants to creatively put into the vinyl it's such a great format for a physical product now of course I could have a USB stick with a wave on there but it's not really the same thing as having a USB stick and versus a vinyl with a big front cover maybe you could make a presentation box and put the USB stick in there but then I might as well just download it because it's a digital file it doesn't feel like I've bought anything for my money apart from I might as well get a poster and then listen to it on Spotify so it doesn't really feel like you've got any additional value from it but the physical format of vinyl is just so nice to have as an actual physical product and just the way mechanically physically how it works that you've got this diamond being dragged through a physical plastic groove and it's vib causing vibrations and that's being amplified and all sorts of uh, EQ and amplification is going on and it somehow works and it somehow sounds fantastic despite the crude physical implementation and some people think that vinyl has been going since like I don't know like the the 30s or 40s or something like this or it's got a really long history back almost 150 years with the Edison wax cylinders and it's such a fascinating format and if we're comparing vinyl to analog tape for example sure analog tape can sound real nice but it's actually a lot cheaper to get yourself a vinyl player than it is to buy a reel to reel tape machine a good reel to reel tape machine is quite a lot of money nowadays Whereas you can pick up a pretty reasonable vinyl player for just a couple of hundred quid and get a second hand one for even less than that maybe and it can sound really good. And then to actually buy releases on quarter inch analog tape or especially half inch analog tape, it's quite difficult and you have to get them at specialist sources and they're, they're very expensive and they were probably just um, made from digital sources anyway. I don't know. I don't really trust that it's like the whole analog chain thing because it would just be so much easier to not to do that and just like get the CD version and transfer it to reel to reel. But anyway, I think vinyl is great. I was just making a point that there's no magical sound to vinyl. I'm just debunking the standard audio file hi-fi myths. And I think it's important to debunk this stuff so we can focus on what's actually true and not just perpetuate the myths by the hi-fi crew.